Okay, welcome back, everybody. It is quite a long walk to um, coffee, so hopefully a few more people will be talking down over the next five minutes or so. But we better um, make a start um, to keep to time. So this is the first sort of, um, uh, what should we call it, um, overview type um, session of this um, section meeting this morning and this afternoon. So this morning it's going to be um, on urinary tract infection involving um, laboratory and clinical microbiological studies. And then this afternoon is a joint meeting with the section of oncology, which my colleague and incoming chair of the section, Howard Kynaston, we introduce after lunch. So w welcome everybody to the first one, which is the entitled Multi Resistance in Escherichia coli, the Threat um, Phreology. And I'd like to welcome my colleague and co-chair, Asad Ali, who's um, done a lot of research, both laboratory and clinical, into um, urinary tract infection. And I, as you may notice from the program, you don't get a section on you don't get a session on infection for years, and then three come along at once. So this is the second um, UTI section. The section of female urology got in first with a very clinical um, session on UTI. So this is taking a step back, if you like. And what we wanted to do is to try and look at emerging um, laboratory, um, emerging clinical and emerging diagnostic themes that are probably going to change our approach to the diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment decision-making in infection, particularly, obviously, for us in urinary tract infection. So we're very, infor very fortunate to have some um, prestigious speakers from, a, from the UK and um, from Germany to tell us some of these um, aspects. So... Um, the first speaker I'd like to introduce is um, Dr. Matt um, Upton, who is a reader in, in medical microbiology at um, Peninsula University in, in Plymouth. So Matt and Matt's um, so a basic science microbiologist, if you like, so not so much on the clinical side, but really looking at the laboratory behavior of bacteria, particularly E. coli, that may then inform um, future diagnostics and future treatments. So Matt, thank you very much for coming and um, look forward to your talk. So what we're going to do is get each presenter to give their talk and then have some questions after each talk. And then at the end, there'll probably be some time for additional discussion as well. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invite <coughs> to come to talk to you today. Um, and uh, it's, it's good to be back in Manchester. I actually left, left Manchester a couple of years ago, um, and much of the work that I will talk to you about in a moment uh, was carried out in Manchester. So, um, Rob asked if I could talk to you all a little bit about resistance mechanisms in E. coli. So, um, in this particular setting um, <coughs> of, uh, of um, <coughs> urology, it's, it's an area that's quite, quite new to me, really, in some ways, so I've been doing some reading um, but as I've read, I've realised how close some of this work is to my own work in uh, uropathogenic E. coli infections of the urinary tract. So I'll tell you a little bit about the two main resistance mechanisms, um, and then I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, what I think is driving uh, the increase in, in particularly fluoroquinolone resistance. Uh, that's a problem. So quinolone resistance, um, E. coli carries a number of different mechanisms for uh, resistance to quinolones, quinolone antibiotics, um, um, efflux pumps, um, which pump the drug uh, out of the cell, or stop them getting into the cells. Pourings, which stop the antibiotics getting into the cells. Um, and um, particular enzymes, um, or enzymes that modify the antibiotic to stop it working. Most importantly in E. coli, though, are um, these mutations in the target site for the quinolone. So the quinolones um, act on top of some arrays, on DNA gyrase, they, they act on the um, uh, DNA replication machinery. This region in blue is called the quinolone resistance determining region, and it's where the fluoroquinolones interact with the, uh, the, the DNA replication machinery. So they interfere with replication of DNA, um, killing the bacteria. Mutations in this area, particularly in residues 83 and 87, um, interfere with the way in which the quinolones interact with the DNA gyrase, as an example here. Um, and this 
This reduces the affinity of the antibiotic for the binding site, making the organisms resistant to the action of the fluoroquinolones. So mutations um, in the uh, gyre region of the DNA replication machinery, very important in quinolone resistance um, in E. coli. The other thing that doesn't particularly seem to be raised as a, as a resistance issue for your cells um, is resistance for cephalosporins, but that's particularly in neuropathogenic E. coli. This is the thing that, that we pick up on most often. Um, <clears throat> cephalosporin resistance is different because it's not encoded by uh, mutations in, it, in the target site for the, for the antibiotic. Cephalosporin resistance is essentially a result of degradation of the beta-lactam ring, which is shown here in a cephalosporin antibiotic. So the beta-lactam ring is, um, is degraded. This uh, bond here is broken by an enzyme, the beta-lactamase, and that renders the antibiotic ineffective. So it can't carry out its, um, um, <clears throat> its mechanism of interference with the bacterial cell wall, so the, the bacteria are able to survive if they can degrade the antibiotic. So as I say, this is carried out by beta-lactamase enzymes, of, of which there are a number of different types. The type that is most important, um, certainly in the UK now, is uh, the CTXM type, the um, kefataximases. So the, uh, these act preferentially on kefataxim anti uh, antibiotics. Prior to 2000, uh, TEM and SFHV beta-lactamases were more important, but it's these that are now really coming to the fore and being the big, uh, the big issue, CTXM enzymes. They're carried by plasmids. I mentioned plasmids in a moment, so uh, this means they're very transmissible. They read, readily transmit between different bacteria, um, taking with them uh, the antibiotic resistance mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> so these are mainly plasmid-mediated, um, but uh, we've done some work recently which is showing the, the, the role of this um, AMP-C beta-lactamase, um, which can either be chromosomally or plasmid-encoded. So we're starting to learn lots more about um, the role of these beta-lactamases in the uh, resistance to cephalosporin antibiotics. These resistance mechanisms are transmitted between bacteria in a number of different ways. <clears throat> um, trans bacterial transformation involves the uptake of uh, naked DNA from one organism, which is either releasing or, or lies in dying and lysing and releasing DNA, is taken up by another organism, which incorporates the DNA, which may include a, an antibiotic resistance gene, incorporates that into its own genome, conferring resistance to this, uh, to this new the res, um, recipient cell. Um, the most obvious example of this is penicillin binding protein uh, changes in Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, Streptococcus pneumoniae is readily tran uh, naturally transformable. It's very good at taking DNA from the environment. E. coli is not, so this role, uh, this, this particular mechanism doesn't play much of a role in E. coli resistance. Um, transduction involves the infection of a, of a donor cell with a phage, a bacteriophage, um, <clears throat> which uh, replicates itself. And in that process, it can take fragments of the bacterial chromosome from the donor, incorporate it into its own um, package of DNA, and then infects a recipient cell, injecting its DNA into the recipient cell, which then uh, repeats this process. But during that process, an antibiotic resistance gene may become incorporated into the, the chromosome of the recipient cell, again making this um, uh, resistant to particular antibiotics, perhaps. Um, potentially a number of different um, antibiotic resistance mechanisms that are chromosomally encoded can be transferred in this way. Um, <clears throat> in E. coli, this is more important in transfer of vir vir uh, virulence mechanisms, virulence genes, rather than antibiotic resistance genes. This is uh, of growing importance, this mechanism, in, in, um, in transfer of uh, genes from environmental bacteria into pathogenic bacteria. Um, and that includes potentially uh, the transfer of genes within the gut of, a, of us, of a host. So if you have a pathogenic organism receiving DNA from a non-pathogenic organism which has resistance mechanisms, uh, that makes this a, then a virulent and antibiotic resistant organism. Most important in E. coli though is this bottom uh, slide, uh, part of the slide here, where we have plasmids which are self-replicating pieces of DNA which transfer themselves from one cell to another. Uh, they often they have uh, the genes, they encode the genes that are necessary for their own transfer, but they start picking up in one cell antibiotic resistance genes and they then transfer those to another cell. This is the most important mechanism um, that, that we know of for, for transfer of um, uh, 
beta-lactamase type resistances, so the TEM and SHV or the CTXM type resistances uh, to beta-lactamases, um, and also some quinolone resistances occur in this way. Um, but I should stress that um, these mechanisms aren't particularly important in the acquisition or the development of fluoroquinolone resistance, that's more mutation of the, uh, um, of the target site, as I say. So that's how um, uh, resistance occurs to quinolones and um, fluoroquinolones and um, uh, to cephalosporins in E. coli. Um, I, I'm, clearly, I don't need to tell uh, this particular audience that E. coli is the leading agent of um, uh, post-biopsy um, infection. <clears throat> and I also probably don't need to tell you that fluoroquinolone resistance is a growing and an important issue. Um, but what I would like to do is, is kind of build on this. So we know that fluoroquinolone-resistant E. coli are important, but what particular types of fluoroquinolone E. coli are important? And is it important to know what particular types of E. coli um, are, are causing these sorts of infections? Um, <clears throat> a lot of work in my group involves use of this technique called multilocus sequence typing. This is a very powerful technique for looking at how E. coli are related on other organisms how they're related to each other and how they've evolved over time. Um, and there are now a number of studies that are demonstrating that this one particular type, SD131, sequence type 131 E. coli, is very important in causing uh, post-biopsy um, infection. There's a study here from 2012, carried out in, um, in Auckland, in New Zealand, uh, where this particular type, sequence type SD131, fluoroquinolone resistant, um, e. coli was uh, found to, to be cause a, a significant proportion of um, post-biopsy infections. Um, interestingly to me, cephalosporin resistance wasn't really mentioned in this paper, but the, the isolates will be cephalosporin resistant as well. Um, and again, this paper, very recent paper um, from an, a group in Israel showed that um, post-biopsy sepsis and urosepsis um, carry similar numbers of this sequence type 131 strain. So I'd just tell you like I'd like to tell you a little bit more about SD131 E. coli now because by understanding this particular strain, now we know that it's very important, I think we can start to try and do something about it rather than just treating it with um, more cephalosporins or, or quinolones. So SD131 I say emerging, um, it's now we're now in certain fields starting to really understand um, <clears throat> the epidemiology of this organism, where it's come from um, and what it's doing. Um, we know it's globally disseminated. Um, when we first uh, started isolating it, we found it was of a new serotype, so this again suggested to it was a, a, an emerging clone. It wasn't something we'd seen before. Um, for us, uh, cephalotaximase 15, CTXM15, is a particular marker of this strain, and uh, fluoroquinolone resistance is a hallmark. So this is very important for this organism. But unusually, they're often gentamicin susceptible. And this, this uh, susceptibility profile is pretty much a, a kind of a, a key for SD131 E. coli. Um, <clears throat> just in passing, I mentioned that we've, we've looked at the plasmids in some of these organisms, and, and this is just a collection of the antibiotic resistance mechanisms that one particular strain carries. So there's resistance to eight different classes of antimicrobials here. There's also multiple beta-lactamases. So there's a um, beta-lactamase here, another one here, um, and an extended spectrum beta-lactamase here. So these, these bacteria are very well armed in terms of antibiotic resistance, and they're also very keen on keeping these plasmids. They have many mechanisms for retaining the plasmids in their cells. Um, <clears throat> and, and clearly they pass them uh, between each other using uh, conjugation and transfer of the plasmids. I'll tell you a little bit about the, um, how I became involved in SD131, the story, because it, it essentially it started um, just two miles down the road when I was working at the University of Manchester in the Clinical Sciences Building at the Manchester Royal Infirmary. We were typing E. coli using the MLST technique that I mentioned earlier, um, and a, a clinician from Preston got in touch and said um, that, that he'd seen um, a really quite worrying rise in the, um, in the proportion of urinary coliforms, so most of these would have been E. coli, um, that are co-resistant to ciprofloxacin, trimethoprim, and cephalexin. Um, so that, that went from the, the usual background low levels um, up to um, 4% um, in a in, uh, little over a year, really, in a way. So he wanted to know what was behind this, what was driving this. Was it an um, outbreak of one particular uh, 
clone or was it uh, many different organisms? So uh, these organisms were also associated with a, a significantly increased mortality in, um, in matched patient groups that didn't have infection with, um, they had infection with susceptible organisms. <clears throat> so we designed a study looking at organisms from around the area. So these were clinical and, and hospital isolates, 88 we collected from Manchester and Stockport, so very urban areas, um, uh, Preston, small town in the north, and then quite rural areas. Um, <clears throat> these were all uh, cephalosporin-resistant E. coli, so they were selected on the basis of antimicrobial resistance profile. And what we saw was really quite a diverse collection of organisms here. Um, many different types, sequence types causing infection, but clearly standing out in the middle was this ST131, which we'd not come across before. Um, at the time in 2008, 2007, 8, we queried this against a database, and um, this little guy appears to remind me that the only other isolate in the database was a badger isolate. Uh, that's changed now. Um, not because badgers aren't the only things, they, they spread it to other people, but we've started looking um, in, in other populations and found SD131 pretty much anywhere we look. So this organism, was this particular type of organism of E. coli was very overrepresented in urine and blood. Um, <clears throat> and in 2008, when we published our paper, three other papers came out um, reporting um, SD131 E. coli at the same time across the globe. This was a situation in 2008, North America, Europe, um, through the Middle East. By 2011, pretty much everywhere uh, was reporting SD131 E. coli. Um, I gave a talk in Australia in 2009. Uh, they didn't have any there then. Immediately they started looking, uh, they started to find it. So clearly a uh, globally disseminated, very important organism. Um, uh, the... That, that, that's kind of moved on. So we were carrying out MLST, multilocal sequence typing, that told us what particular types of organism was, was uh, causing these infections. Um, we, we, we've, uh, ourselves and other groups have now started to investigate this in more detail by sequencing the genomes of these organisms. Um, and a group in the States in 2013 published this paper here where they took um, Cephalosporin-resistant E. coli <clears throat> from uh, urinary tract. This group has actually done quite a lot of work in um, uh, post-prostate um, uh, biopsy infections as well. Um, and they characterise the organisms at the genome level. Um, so these are all SD131 E. coli's. They've subtyped SD131 by looking at... Um, these are fimbri on the sur surface of E. coli, and they have a little adhesin on the end of this um, fimbri, and you kind of type that fee, uh, the, the sequence of that, um, that adhesin, and these are all type 30. So these are a subtype within um, SD131. Um, <clears throat> they then found these uh, quinolone-resistant subtypes, so they all have um, mutations. They're all fluoroquinolone-resistant, so this uh, blue, I don't know how well it comes out, this blue box covers all those that are quinolone-resistant. And then within that, uh, there's a, an Rx group, which are also CTXM. Positive, so they're cephalosporin resistant. So what you have here is a kind of um, Russian doll set up, really, in a way, of, of um, uh, E. coli, which is fully susceptible to uropathogenic E. coli, which is a subgroup of E. coli, and then SD131, a subgroup of UPEC, and then the quinolone resistant and the quinolone and cephalosporin resistant ones. If you look at the sepsis, rate of sepsis in this, there's a relative risk of in increasing relative risk of um, sepsis as you uh, get progressively further towards these uh, cephalosporin fluoroquinolone resistant organisms um, and it's a 7.5 fold increase of uh, risk of sepsis as, as you get to this point here compared to um, uh, regular UPEC. Um, so really quite important organisms in our eyes and in the eyes of the group. Um, this is the uh, Evgeny Sukarenko was the lead author on this paper and this was his quote, um, really because of the, the resistance and the virulence of this organism. I haven't said anything about the virulence, but it is a very virulent organism. Um, the, the impacts of this uh, Rx clone um, could exceed that of any other bacterial strain known. This is a single bacterial strain um, that is uh, clearly causing problems in their group, but is, has a global significance. Um, I won't dwell on this, but we've carried out a study of... Um, uh, nearly 100 isolates from across the world. So these are from um, basically all across the world from 2000 to 2011. Um, and that's represented in these coloured dots here. 
and hopefully you can see, uh, ignoring the detail, but you can see that there's no clustering on the basis of geography um, uh, or time. So these are these are organisms that are um, have become disseminated across the world. We think since pre-2000, evolving from a single uh, single strain of the organism uh, that has developed resistance to quinolones by having those mutations on the chromosome and then has acquired cephalosporin resistance through uh, acquisition of a plasmid. And at the genetic level, the genome level, these are highly related organisms suggesting they have just expanded across the globe. Um, one last thing to say about um, some of the, the work that we're, we're doing, as I say, by understanding what particular type of E. coli is responsible for most of these infections, we might be able to do something to um, uh, prevent their infections or just to understand their tra transmission. Um, and we've been looking at the metabolic diversity, so the ability of these organisms to carry out different biochemical processes. Um, and ST131 is significantly uh, more metabolically diverse. It's able to grow in different environments um, much more significant, at a, a significant degree uh, above other sequence types that we would expect to see in, in um, Europathogenic setting. Uh, these groups here, um, 73, 95, um, and 10 have also been found in, in prostate biopsy um, infections. Um, and there are also certain regions of the genome that we know SD131 are the only organisms that carry, and these are related to meta metabolism. So we're looking at this as a, as a kind of um, a, a fitness um, characteristic of SD131. They're possibly more able to persist in the gut, where they may then acquire more resistance mechanisms. We think it's the gut that they're, or I think it's the gut that they're um, kind of hiding out in. This was a study in 2008 by one of the groups that first announced SD131. Uh, so they found them in, in healthy uh, subjects living in Paris. A uh, really recent paper looking at coronization, gut coronization of children and their mothers with E. coli. 20% of the uh, mothers carried fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli. Pretty much all of those were um, SD131 H30. And childhood colonization was really linked with, not with prior antibiotic use, but with length of stay and maternal colonization. So the mothers are passing these on to their children. Um, also a lot of interest in, uh, in the um, acquisition and the uh, transmission, inter-household transmission of organisms between um, domestic pets. Um, and uh, so a recent study from a group in Liverpool showing SD131 in dogs. So I think really um, SD131 has got the balance right. It's been able to um, acquire resistance, develop resistance to quinolones, then acquire resistance, sorry, to, to acquire resistance to cephalosporins. Um, but it's, it's also got this kind of metabolic fitness that might contribute to its ability to persist in the gut and, and acquire, um, acquire genes for resistance. I'd just like to thank some of the people that we worked with in, in Manchester when I was here. Uh, Majid got his PhD on Friday this week, last week. Um, then the groups in uh, Preston. John Cheeseville was the, uh, the clinician in, in uh, Preston that started most of this work off. And I think I should probably finish there, so thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Matt. So it's a fantastic illustration of evolutionary biology of um, one of the threats um, to our clinical work, particularly, obviously, with illustration with uh, prostate biopsy. Are there any questions for Matt? From the audience. Sorry, I said, Richard. Um, that's, that's really interesting. It's always got quite scary as well. Um, SC131 colonization, uh, obviously, you know, the, the biggest you know, uh, worry is that these um, even newborn babies being colonized. Can it actually, is there a way to clear it? So we've had, we're all familiar as clinicians with MRSA, and there's various clear, clearance regimes for mm. MRSA. I'm not aware of any clearance regime for E. coli. So if you've got ST131, are you, is that it? Are you, are you basically stuffed? How, how long you carry it for, I'm not sure. Um, I think where it can be important is in, in, um, uh, in, in carrying out um, rectal swab screening, those sorts of things. And if you know there's quinolone resistant or ST131 E. coli is there, specifically trying to remove them uh, prior to biopsy. In terms of gut, gut decolonization, uh, I don't know of any, any mechanisms or any studies that have tried it, and, and you wouldn't be able to specifically, I don't think, take out ST131. Uh, we've all got E. coli in our gut, and they're contributing very positively to our, uh, to our health, so we wouldn't want to remove E. coli from the gut. So I think um, it, it's something that we probably need to manage 
if we can, um, uh, in, in this setting, at, at um, uh, biopsy or um, uh, with, with perhaps with specific mechanisms. One, one benefit of having something that's disseminated globally is if you can find a vaccine that's specific to SD131, then there are groups working on this because we know there are certain features of SD131 that are specific to SD131. You can then vaccinate and prevent just SD131. I mean, my worry was that if they've colonized with this, so they, yeah. we, we discover it on the butt, on the butt, and then it's sensitive to, let's just say, uh, you know, kefalexin or something. We then give it, we give them that to try and end them. We effectively, by inevitably, we're going to start giving them the antibiotics that, that it isn't resistant to and, and effectively creating the very thing you're showing is mm. happening. I, I don't know how we don't do that. Um, no, they're, they're not more um, <clears throat> kind of um, non specific ways to, to um, sterilize the, uh, for a biopsy, sterilize the, 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 the rectum before. Um, before taking the sample. I guess that, that would be the way to go. Uh, Florian, I think, was next. Yeah, if you were to design a point of care testing to pick up um, resistance mechanisms on a genetic basis, what markers would you include to pick up fluoroquinolone resistance, cephalosporin resistance, and would you also include a marker for the ST131? Uh, you could include, um, I think I'd probably include a marker for ST131, um, quinolone resistance, the, the gyre uh, mutations, gyre par, par mutations are most important, um, and um, acquisition of multiple mutations uh, significantly increases the MIC for, for all quinolone, so I'd look at those. Um, and I think for this particular organism, CTXM15, CTXM14, a cephalosporin um, markers that I would look for. Um, uh, as I say, AMP-C, I think, is something, um, inducible AMP-C is something that is, is probably also worth including. Okay, yes, sorry, um, question now. Is there a case, is there a case of uh, avoiding trust biopsies altogether? It seems like a losing battle. Sorry, is there a... A case of avoiding trust biopsies altogether if... Uh, um, if it's so high risk. Yeah, yeah sorry, I mean... <laughs> I guess if you if you can demonstrate colonization, rectal colonization, then um, uh, um, th th there should be mechanisms to 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 prevent. Um, well, I believe there's mechanism to prevent infection following following um, uh, biopsy. But, but I think that's something probably more for clinical colleagues to answer. Could I just ask, Matt? Is there any evidence that this is a new thing? linked to increased mobility of populations and antibiotic use pressures, environmental pressures, or do you think it's something that's been going on throughout history and I don't, I don't really know. Um, now? Yeah, I think it's so, so widely uh, disseminated. So those, those um, the 95 genomes that we looked at from across, across the globe from that 10-year period, um, if you take out the, the, the very variable regions of the genome, um, there were only 70 SNPs, so 70 single nucleotide polymorphisms between the whole collection of, of the, the, the sort of RX group. Um, so I think they've been disseminated a long, long time ago. Uh, the American group have demonstrated O25B E. coli in archival collections back to 1965, I think. Okay. So I think it's something how it originally got out there. So it may well be that most of us have got ST131 in our, in our gut because perhaps it is a good gut coloniser. Yeah. Um, but it's just then been selected by quinolone and cephalosporin Oh, OK. Use. So it's there and then it's been modified yeah. by antibiotic usage yeah. or over-usage. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, um, Matt. Thank you.